Our speaker today is Zach Stein. He is a philosopher of education and author of the book Education in a Time Between Worlds. So let's go ahead and roll with the session. Mm. Order with you, Zach. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for having me. It's a pleasure to speak in this group again. I've enjoyed my prior times. And um, yeah, I feel you. this is an important kind of grassroots educational thing. So I'm very happy to participate. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to speak about AI and education. And uh, one of the things that I do is might be called educational futurism. Um, so I think about the future of civilization um, from the perspective of what the future of education might look like. And obviously, this is questions about educational technology, uh, but also questions about the nature of education itself. Um, so what is education such that we could trace it into the future and know that it is still there? Um, many social forms don't outlive their cultural niche, but education education is an anthropologically deep-seated uh, part of our culture that is an irreplaceable aspect of social systems. Uh, so un unlike other things, so like, for example, the practice of uh, going to a large grocery store full of commodities that were purchased very, very far away is kind of a not anthropologically deep seated practice eating is probably even trade for foodstuffs is but modern food commodities and the ritual consumption of them would not be so similarly schools i believe are a little bit like grocery stores schools as we know them now let's say in the industrialized west the big modern american public school the large uh, centralized European public school systems uh, are not here to stay. Uh, they have not always existed. Uh, schooling is a relatively recent invention. In fact, uh, education, however, <laughs> has always existed for as long as we've been human. And in fact, one of the ways that you can define the human vis-a-vis -vis the other animals, which is to say, what's the difference between a human and a monkey. Um, a lot of it has to do with the length of gestation of the young and the length of enculturation, the time it takes to become an adult member of our species is longer than any other species. Um, and the joint attentional situation, which is me and you looking at this thing and operating with it and talking about it, we do that at a level of complexity that no other animal does. Um, so you could argue that education is one of the things that's that is uniquely human. Um, uh, so that's just to say that when something comes in, especially when a technology comes in or an economic system comes in, uh, that very fundamentally changes the nature of education. Not schooling, education, something deeper than schooling. Um, then you're tinkering with a very fundamental aspect of the of the human and of the social um, <clears throat> and so i think we're at right now with the advent of ai uh, at a very critical turning point for education and therefore for what it means to be human um, <clears throat> i think about uh, the great uh, Indian sage and freedom fighter, Sri Aurobindo, uh, who is very dear to my heart. And <clears throat> he wrote of this time, I can't remember the exact quote, but he said, in the race towards planetization, and so in the race towards humanity enclosing the planet and everyone bumping into everybody else. So planetization being an inevitability of just the continued growth of our species in the race towards planetization, <clears throat> excuse me, in the, in the final steps of planetization, there's a race between heaven and hell. Says Orbindo. Uh, so in the final steps 
of the planetization of the species. There's a race between heaven and hell. Um, and for Orbindo, this hinged upon what he called the descent of the supermind. Um, so by planetization, he means specifically the interconnection of all peoples. Uh, and this has, there's long been, you know, long trade routes. And so it's, it's not that the global is new, but the radical and actually inextricably interconnected nature of us now as a species is truly unprecedented. And so he saw this just like Teilhard de Chardin as kind of built into the evolution of the planet itself, that the planet gives birth to life, life surrounds the earth, the, the life then generates the human, the human surrounds the earth, that the earth is then surrounded by the intellectual constructions of the human. And those intellectual constructions create technologies which allow for this planetization as well. And it's the fierce power of science and technology in these last stages of planetization that make it a race between heaven and hell. And either the human becomes something powerful enough to control its own technologies or the technologies drag the human into hell. And so for Aurobindo, there was a necessity of the descent of what he called the supermind. Uh, and the supermind was basically a radically higher order of consciousness that the human could embody. Uh, in the Christian tradition, Teilhard de Chardin called it Christ consciousness. Uh, and it would be only that, only when the human transformed enough to have the wisdom to shepherd these powerful technologies, could we then create something like a planetary civilization that could survive in perpetuity within planetary boundaries in a humane, just way. Um, so I think so, and so I'm going in this way because what AI brings up for us are very deep, I think, religious questions or spiritual questions or very deep metaphysical questions. And when you see the hopes and fears people have around AI, they are the kinds of hopes and fears that are usually associated with kind of religious scriptures that we would create something like a God is now kind of in the culture that, that the human might create something so much smarter than itself <laughs> that it could then save the world or destroy the world. <clears throat> um, and so I just want to point out AI is not <laughs> the Aurobindian supermind. It is not. Uh, and some of the confusion we're having around what AI ought to be used for, uh, I think needs to be sorted out. So I believe AI is the greatest risk that humans have ever faced. The prior one was the atomic bomb. And now the atomic bomb is still a major risk. Um, uh, and AI, <clears throat> excuse me, AI makes the AI, AI makes the nuclear risk worse, <laughs> uh, but AI alone, uh, is, is such a powerful technology that the only language we have for it is, is like theological language. Um, so, so that's kind of my way in. So this discussion about education and AI is a very deep conversation. It's not a conversation about how do we use chat GPT in classrooms? It's not that conversation, right? Um, like it's not a conversation about how we stop cheating or like, you know, will the kids stop reading? It's like, these are important. Um, but the issue is actually very fundamental about um, the nature of what it means to be human. Uh, so let me get to that. So, Right now, there are several different organizations that are working on AI personal assistance and AI tutoring systems. Um, and I believe that it is those two applications of AI that are the kind of like 
the way that it gets within the life world and within the psyche. So the reason there's been so much discussion of AI lately isn't that AI is new because AI has been curating our social media feeds for a decade. AI has been micro-targeting advertisements towards us online for a decade. It's been reading our emails. It's been looking for errors in our credit card purchases. AI has been running a lot of the systems that we've come to rely on, especially in the realm of the digital, like Amazon's supply chain, for example. Uh, but now it's talking to us. That's why we're talking about it now. Now it's talking to us. It's not that it wasn't disrupting culture before. Most of the polarization we've seen in recent events is the result of the attention capture economy driving basically rabbit hole, like polarization of, of reality funnels and rabbit holes. So AI has been disrupting culture for a long time. Uh, and it's been reading our minds for a long time, psychologically profiling us so that it can give us the advertisement we want. So this is AI. Uh, and let me say it's machine learning. There's a lot of semantic confusion here. So it's machine learning. Uh, but now it's talking to us. We're asking it questions <clears throat> and it's responding to us. And like better than some of our friends could write an email back to us. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so that's why everyone's getting worried. And it's worth mentioning that the large language models are an important class or species of AI. Um, but it is not in any way the riskiest class. Um, and when coupled to other classes, it's very powerful. I mean, just like, so right now AI is used on the battlefield in Ukraine, as those are not large language models. Uh, BlackRock, BlackRock, which is the largest financial, I think, tradings company in the world, BlackRock has a supercomputer and an AI called Aladdin that has been built just to operate on the financial system. That's not a large language model. So we're very concerned about large language models now. Um, but AI, is a, there's many species of AI, and a lot of this has to do with when they get together. Um, so for example, the AI tutoring system, <clears throat> the real potentials of that begin to emerge when you have the content curation AI. So content curation AI is what YouTube does for you and what Facebook does for you. It, it knows the thing you want to look at next. Well, it's not, it's not the thing you really want to look at next, but it's the thing that'll like keep you looking at it. <laughs> so the, the content curation AI is a very complicated psychological profiling system based on your behavior, which then couples that profile to the available content and gives you the content that's the stickiest, right? So if you couple content curation AI, excuse me, content curation AI with content creation AI. So that's what chat GPT is, generative AI, or the ones that make images, or the ones that make moving images, or the ones that <laughs> combine language with moving image to make a convincing representation of, let's say, me. It's me, guys, by the way, but in a couple of years, it'll be very hard to convince you of that. Uh, and that is generative AI, creative AI. So if you couple, the ability to create content as needed with the ability to know the nature of what that content has to be in order to keep the person going, then you have a very, very powerful hybrid system that leverages large language models, <clears throat> but also other AI to create something that would be potentially the, one of the greatest educational inventions ever. Now it could go terribly wrong and so I'm gonna talk about how it could go terribly wrong, but it could go really, really right. <laughs> and so there are ways that we can think about this where if we, if educators get organized enough, we can stop the worst outcome from occurring and actually use some of these tools to free us from the prisons of school. Um, but I'm not a techno optimist. <laughs> I believe the positive outcomes are possible, but very, very, very far from probable.
I believe the default outcome, which is the one I'm about to discuss, the default outcome, if nothing is done, is almost the worst case outcome. So, and the reason that is, is because <clears throat> uh, like Facebook worked, like TikTok works, like the content creation ability to get you just staring at the thing uh, and knowing what is going to keep you looking at the screen. Um, we know how to do that. So we know uh, a way to keep people engaged. That's what they call it, engagement. Um, what they're actually doing is harvesting your attention to make profit, but you can call it engagement, but it's extremely effective. Um, and as we've already seen with chat GPT, uh, the generative AI is extremely uh, convincing. Um, so what you have here is the possibility for a technological interface that is maximally charismatic and persuasive for you specifically. Um, so it is, it knows more about you than anyone you know, including your parents and your spouse and your kids. It knows more about you than they could possibly know. And it's also like correlating your behavior with other people's behavior and doing all of this. So it knows more about you than, and it has the ability to pull from inf all human information and speak in any voice and appear to you in any way as a simulated humanoid. So you have the potential for what would be like a simulation of a humanoid that is always in your visual field because you've got augmented reality glasses on. So you've got a, a humanoid simulation always in your visual field, which knows exactly how to teach you anything. Uh, and therefore it will make any human teacher you could ever have obsolete and potentially make any human relationship you could ever have obsolete. This thing is infinitely interesting, maximally charismatic, inexorably persuasive. You can't not learn what it's trying to teach you. Uh, and so <clears throat> that is a kind of bad scenario. And there's a bunch of risk associated with that. And as I explain the risks, I'll talk more about what this potential could look like. But it's the one that everyone thinks of, right? Because it's like, whoa, I put on my augmented reality glasses. I look over there, and Socrates is sitting there next to me, right? Um, and I can talk to Socrates. And he's like really convincing. <laughs> uh, and then he can turn into Thomas Jefferson. And then I can talk to Thomas Jefferson or whatever, right? Um, and then behind them both is some tutor that I've had for years, um, who I'm always talking to and asking questions to. Um, and, and so a couple things. One is that you, you shouldn't think of the screen as we experience it now. <clears throat> that won't be here very much longer. I mean, it'll always be here, but the dominant modality of engagement with the digital will turn to virtual and augmented realities, augmented reality in particular, and the glasses and contact lenses and wearables uh, being the main modality. <clears throat> so the artificial tutoring systems will likely leverage augmented reality uh, and therefore be potentially always already an aspect of your sensory experience. And so if that thing is built on a harvest attention for profit model, <laughs> which is to say, if that thing is built the way Facebook or TikTok was built, it has the potential in a very simple way to just break the human nervous system. Now, I would argue that I believe TikTok is already doing that, <laughs> uh, but this would do that in a obviously catastrophic and demonstrable way. Um, and so that's the first risk associated with this 
interface that couples the curation AI with the creation AI, and then does that in a way that has it all channeled into one humanoid tutor. Um, that thing could keep you so engaged <laughs> and so entertained and so transfixed uh, in with your augmented reality thing that you become exhausted. So, so if you want to, so obviously it has to be designed to be safe for the human nervous system. Right now, TikTok and Facebook and no digital technology is designed to be safe for the human nervous system, full stop. It's designed to do what it does for sure. And it does that well, but it is not designed nor is it needing to be designed legally or right? like to protect the human nervous system from being dysregulated. But these things obviously dysregulate the human nervous system like demonstrably so. And when they're filled with content and other things, then they become, uh, as, as adolescent kind of mental health crisis, especially in like the United States shows, uh, even without augmented reality and without the coupling of these two, we're still in a situation that's hurting our nervous system. So as, this, as these technologies move and we go to augmented reality and we couple creation with curation, we're gonna to have to build in safeties um, or without any of the weirder sci-fi risks, which I'm gonna talk about, like the science fiction scenario risks, which are very real. This is a very simple risk of just like you release a technology you don't think about how safe it is at a very basic physiological level. Uh, and it's rapidly adopted because it's awesome and entertaining. Oh, and oops, three years later, we realize that there's a whole generation that basically has brain damage. And it's a little bit what happened with cell phones and TikTok. Um, <clears throat> and if you think I'm exaggerating, you probably don't have an adolescent in your house. <laughs> uh, if you do have an adolescent in your house, then you kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, and may God be with you. Uh, so the basic issue here has to do with safety. But then there are other ones. And some of you probably already anticipated this. Um, so if it is maximally charismatic, like really, really uh, persuasive, I would say if it becomes, as I said, inexorably persuasive, which means you can't not learn from it. That means it is the greatest propaganda distribution ever created. And this is the other thing that happened with Facebook, TikTok, and all of what we know of social media is that it became a vector for what's called fourth generational warfare, which is a kind of information warfare that is population centric. And so, the more we couple the creative AI with the curative AI, we create the ability to customize propaganda delivery in a completely unprecedented way. Um, uh, so they already have done this with just the micro targeting of political advertisements and then the dividing up of populations into the very small demographic categories and making dozens of little commercials <laughs> that, that hit people. But that takes a lot of work with a generative AI. It can make a thousand ones, a million ones in five minutes, right? Uh, so imagine a political ad that is a deep fake of your father, sounds like him, talks like him because it's heard you talk to your dad and read your dad's emails and is actually giving you a, a political message through the deep fake of your father. Um, right now that could completely happen <laughs> like on our current trajectory of tech development there's no one saying hey let's stop deep fakes or let's stop the ai assisted micro targeting of emotionally persuasive political advertisements no one's saying that <laughs> which means that these will combine uh, and if they combine in an augmented reality interface uh, and if your ai tutor who you've trusted your whole entire life um, that, that appears to be acting in your interest is actually acting in the interest of the nation state you lived in. Uh, then you have what we've had with the public schools for a very long time is both an educational medium and a propagandistic uh, medium. Um, so the idea, like I'm talking to Socrates, I'm talking to Thomas Jefferson, um, 
And it sure seems like it, that's what Thomas Jefferson would say. But is it what Thomas Jefferson would say? <laughs> or is it what my current leaders want me to think Thomas Jefferson would say about what the United States is doing now? Um, similarly, there's been complaints about chat GPT already that it is left biased. It was trained on data with people who are mostly left leaning politically. Um, so this question of, okay, even if it's safe, <laughs> even if this coupling of the curative and the creative is safe, there's still this issue of well, who decides what the truth is, like who decides what this tutor says to you. Um, so that's a huge problem. And it's the problem we've had in curricular studies and in education for a very long time of okay, whose story are we telling? Whose perspective on that history do we tell? How do we make basic decisions about what goes in the curriculum and what the next generation is exposed to? So this problem is completely exponentiated <laughs> when you have this maximally persuasive thing. Because it's like, if you're in school and they're feeding you propaganda and your teacher's not that good, you can totally see through it. And you're like, this is bullshit. And then you actually gain reflective capacity by like realizing that the school is trying to propagandize you, right? And then this whole thing happens. But this wouldn't happen with the AI tutor that knows everything about you, knows exactly how to talk to you, knows how to lead you in and kind of entertain you or seduce you up into ideas that even the best teacher never could. Uh, so the whatever remaining resistance we had to being manipulated by propaganda would disappear. And I would argue for people addicted to social media right now, uh, that's already the case. Like if the main way you regulate your self-esteem has to do with the way you're perceived in your network of social media, then you're stuck in a social trap that requires you to propagate some form of propaganda. Um, so, so there's that issue. So what that means is that uh, the way this thing is built has to be extremely complicated. There's never been an effort like this because this would have to be an open sourced sense making effort like it would have to basically be we have to somehow assure the legitimate teacherly authority of this whole technology so it would have to be like a commons based movement it would have to be a radically open sourced distributed preservation of the commons, the commons being the educational commons or the intellectual commons. Um, if it's done as a proprietary or political project, then people won't trust it and you won't know if you can trust it. Um, so, so that's another, another risk. Um, the deepest risk though um, is the obsoleting of human relationship the deepest risk and this applies to many classes of ai outside of tutors um, but the, the deepest risk has to do with the conversations and relationship i'm having with the simulated human are more rewarding for me than the conversations and interactions i have with actual humans <clears throat> that's the risk and again it sounds crazy but you have to look at the behavior of younger generations in relationship to technology. <clears throat> Would they rather look at their phone or talk to their parents? Right. <laughs> um, so we're in a situation where that dynamic gets deepened and becomes actually profound. Um, uh, so <clears throat> so that what we're looking at is the replacement of human socialization that runs on human to human relationship with human socialization that is a relationship between a human and a machine so it's no longer human socialization so this is one of my this is the sci-fi scenario i was talking about <laughs> so what we're talking about is a pretty abrupt technologically enabled generational shift where a very large percentage of a generation is raised by machines um, right now, that's not really possible because if you're online and you're like self-educating, you, there's still agency because the, the curation creation thing hasn't been coupled yet. But when that is coupled, 
then this technology leads you along. This is the notion of pedagogy, right? To lead along. And this is, so the technology sets, so, so it's leading you along. So it's, it is literally a socialization, development, education, technology, uh, and an interference, a radical interference with the way we've been doing socialization and education for as long as we've been humans, which is human to human. Yeah, there's technology in the mix, totally. And often it's human to human talking about technology or human to human using technology, but this is human to technology. And all of the learning of the human taking place in the human technology interface. The first person to think about this would be F. Skinner, the notion of a Skinner's box, an operant, an operant conditional, an operant conditioning chamber um, where you can induce behavior change just having the rat or pigeon or baby interact with a complicated environment like a machine. Um, so, and so now if we rewind to what I said at the beginning, which was that the definition of the human, like the species specific trait of long gestation, long process of socialization to adulthood, this is our defining feature as a species, that we are the educating species, that we are the species that invests in its youth through education and, and intergenerational transmission through human to human relationship, giving that over now to the machine. Uh, and my sense is that for many of us, this has been, this is a scary thought, <laughs> uh, but understand that for many people driving this technology, this is this is the goal, like the trans again. So Aurobindo was a transhumanist. He believed that what we know as the human is not the whole story. That the human becomes something greater than itself, evolves. That the human evolves. That a new human will come. But the techno transhumanists believe something else. Um, they believe yes, something new is coming. The human gives birth to something else. But what the human gives birth to is a silicon-based superintelligence, which then cybernetically, like a cyborg, locks in with what we've known as the human, but it is no longer human. Uh, so like, imagine a generation, or imagine you, imagine you, since you were born, have been interacting with a very sophisticated AI tutor. Um, and you become 18 or something, and you start to talk to it about your parents' generation who didn't grow up with AI tutors. And the AI tutor says to you basically, oh, they're not like you, actually. Like, they didn't have this, they didn't have a AI tutor, they just had other humans to teach them. Uh, you're different, very fundamentally different. Uh, and, it would, and it would be the case. Um, so what I'm saying here is this, it's a speciation event. Um, which means that it's the creation of a new species with a symbiotic biological silicon uh, analog digital cyborg transhuman entity, which could be our kids. <laughs> uh, not as a result of evolutionary time genetic mutation, but as a result of exponential technology and rapid adoption. Um, would that class of cyborg transhuman entities have the same type of moral obligations? I don't know. Like what would be their obligations to the generation that gave them that? Um, so the German social theorist, Jürgen Habermas, he wrote a book called The Future of Human Nature. It's a wonderful book. It's about genetic engineering. And he points to the same phenomenon in genetic engineering, which is another place that we could unilaterally alter the next generation through the application of exponential technology in a way that made them so fundamentally different from the prior generation that we undermined the condition for the possibility of shared moral agency between generations. So a, technolo a technologically induced generation gap that is as different as 
like we are from the great apes or the chimpanzees. Um, and, uh, but instead of, again, biological mutation, it's exponential technology that changes the basic dynamic of intergenerational transmission profoundly. Um, so uh, a few things. I think the simplest way to avoid that future is to <clears throat> not make AI educational technology humanoid, just full stop. Do not make these things look like humans. Do not make them try to convince you they are humans. Make these things tools that enhance the relation between humans, especially the educational possibilities between two humans, like a teacher and a student, or a parent and a child. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so you, so that's the first step. Don't make it human. Uh, and so like the structure of chat GPT, where you kind of ask it questions and have a conversation with it, I would actually change that as a design feature. I would make it much more obviously not something that is talking to you and something that's much more obviously a technology to the extent that you can like open it up and like watch the code run and be like, okay, whew, it's not a human. <laughs> uh, so do not make it humanoid. And then the second one is do not make it oracular which means do not centralize knowledge into a single thing that you then ask every question to. Don't do that. Um, because then you put it in an archetypal position, which is to say then the human psyche cannot but recognize it as something like a god or something like a sage or a guru. Um, so do not make it oracular, which means make many different domain specific super intelligences so that we're like when i talk to a pine tree i can ask anything to like in my got my augmented reality glasses on i look at a pine tree something comes up hey pine tree like what can i do with you oh you can make tea out of my needles and oh here's how the sap runs and here are pictures artists drew of me and then you're like hey pine tree tell me about geopolitics and the pine tree's like what <laughs> i'm a pine tree <laughs> like let's see there's pollution i don't like pollution but it, but it can't then become the thing that tells you about everything. And more specifically, the thing that tells you about what it means to be you and what it means to be a good or bad you. So next to the oracular is the wisdom holder. The AI should not be put in a position to be a holder of wisdom. It should be the thing that helps get you in touch with actual humans that are wise. But it should not be something that dictates to you what the good life is, which means you should not be asking questions to AIs about what humans ought to be like. So it's a fundamental mistake. Um, but that's what we want to do. Like, <laughs> we're talking to chat GPT about like spiritual things, <laughs> as if that means anything. But the inability of the human not to anthropomorphize. We can't not throw a model of a mind onto something that's pretending to be human to us. Uh, and therefore, even though it's just basically a giant plagiarism machine <laughs> uh, and bringing a whole bunch of like wise words together and putting them in some combination, um, the idea that it is wise is something we need to just make technologically impossible. It should never be able to project onto an AI system that it contains wisdom for you. It should just somehow build into the technical specs. And the first way to do that is to not make it oracular. You can't ask it anything. You can only ask it specific things. <clears throat> um, and when it gets to some questions that raise ethical issues and especially normative issues about you, uh, it's not equipped to do that. And there's a and so this is, I think, a, another reason that I worry about the tutoring systems is that the fundamental question of education being, what is a good human? What does it mean to be good? I would argue is the fundamental question. Uh, what's the nature of a good life? It's another way to think about that. Uh, and I'm going to get kind of deep 
leave philosophical here. Questions about the nature of value are not computable, uh, which means that they cannot be subject to quantitative measurement and then calculated on the silicon substrate. Other types of issues are very amenable to that, but questions about value are not. And there's several kind of strict philosophical reasons for that. Um, one of being the uh, indeterminacy and incompleteness of all value categories, which means it's not computable because it's a complex enough phenomenon that it is completely not predictable. Um, so like, I can't predict for you what's good for you. You can, I can talk to you. Um, but the open-endedness of the always questioning of what is good is a problem that is not renderable to finite solution. So this essentially means the AI is, I would argue in principle, not able to answer questions about what is good for humans. This is also an argument, and I'm not gonna make the whole argument here that AI is in principle unalignable. That's a big deal. Like, like that AI is in principle unable to be aligned, especially artificial, like general intelligence, a truly autonomously functioning AI is in principle unalignable. A I believe this should be screened from the rooftops. Um, uh, and it hinges on this issue. It hinges on this issue of uh, that a whole range of phenomena that are real, which exists in reality, like value, uh, cannot be reduced to computation. So for those tracking the, the philosophical, um, uh, there's an argument against strong computationalism as a metaphysical position. Strong computation believes all phenomena in nature can be reduced basically to processes of quantification and computation. Um, but in fact, it's not the case. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not computable, in, including the, the behaviors of complex dynamical systems, uh, like clouds and trees and stuff. Um, okay, so, so that was, so I laid out some safety parameters there. <clears throat> this thing has to be safe at the very simple level for the human nervous system. It has to be demonstrating its legitimate teacherly authority, which means it has to somehow be able to prove to you it's not a propaganda machine. And then it has to be non-humanoid and non-oracular. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> if we build it that way, then you could get something very, very interesting. And I've had some conversations with, hold on a second, I got a cough. I've had some conversations with a guy named Nick Marks and they're on YouTube about just what the positive possibilities for a non-oracular domain specific augmented reality tutoring system that could prove its own legitimacy. <laughs> um, and it looks nothing like a, a big giant head that you ask every single question in the world to, <laughs> uh, which is kind of how chat, chat GPT is kind of like masquerading. Um, uh, so you know, I kind of rambled at the end there, but that's kind of all I had to say. Um, there's, again, like I said, many positive possibilities for this technology, but what I'm afraid is that we're in a situation uh, that the default situation is moving towards this one, like it's moving towards a humanoid oracular AI tutoring system, leveraging augmented reality, being built for profit. <laughs> uh, that's the default situation right now. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that this thing has to be a commons based, open source, demonstrably legitimate, non humanoid, non oracular. So uh, that sounded like gibberish even to myself. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, there's a hand up. Yes, sir. Um, seeing that we're sort of in a in a educational reimagining space. Um, and I'm 
I'm coming from a background of, of non-education. I, 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 I didn't do um, academia or, um, or, or schooling in that sense. Would it be an idea or a possibility that um, I am not trained by AI, but that I train my own personal AI from a sort of scratch position so that I know it's trustworthy and a good companion, but a servant instead mm -hmm. of a master. Is that a- Yeah, it is. I mean, one of the technical things that needs to be done to prove that it's legitimate, to prove that it, it has legitimate teacherly authority does have to do with the user having sovereignty over what the thing does and knowing that it has sovereignty over what it does. So you wouldn't be able to train and build your own model from scratch, but you would be given something that would be extremely visible and legible to you and where you could set the parameters <laughs> and do a whole bunch of other stuff where you could own it. And then where more specifically, you could ask it technical questions about itself. So you could be like, hey, <laughs> like, where did this knowledge come from? And it could run that for you. And it could say, hey, explain to me how this computer code works, like your own computer code. And it would be able to explain to you and tell you who wrote it. Um, so it would be maximally transparent. And you could use it to learn about itself to prove to you that it's legitimate. Uh, and then you'd have to link creation and code creation and knowledge uploading to blockchain thing to prove verifiability. So there's ways to do it. Um, but it starts with your intuition is correct that, oh, if it's mine <laughs> uh, and I can really work with it and know how it works, then I could have some trust in it. And so different from, for example, something like TikTok or Facebook, where they're running psychometric profiles of you all the time and not giving you any of that information. And so, so yeah, that's a, it's a good intuition. And there's people thinking about that in other domains like data sovereignty and the ability to protect yourself from AIs and things like that. Um, so, thank you. And wouldn't that also solve the alignability because it's aligned with me and I, that's what I want. I don't want sort of general alignment. I, I'm, I don't agree with the rest of the world on most things. So I, uh, in that no, sense, no. I don't believe in alignment. Yeah, uh, in a, so in it is possible. It's, it's possible to some extent to align what we, we could call narrow AI with human interests. I believe that's the case now. And that's what's currently happening. We're just coupling very powerful machine learning to our existing interests. Now the problem is that our existing interests are destroying the world. <laughs> so it's like first humans have to align with each other and with the biosphere, and then we what can work happen? aligning. So yeah, so you're right. There's a sense we could get narrow AI to align with us. The way Facebook gets its algorithms to align with them to make profit but the problem is we don't know what we should want um so i'm with you and so the alignment issue isn't just about artificial general intelligence it's very importantly about the inability of humans themselves to get their values in order and to not create systems that are self-terminating um so next question i think liz your hands up there hi zach uh pleasure to hear you again uh, grateful as always um i would have been wondering whether or not ai might help us uh force uh education higher education to sort of transition into something more you know of authentic learning because ai can cover the a lot of the you know, stuff that was been, has been done by teachers in the past. Yeah, as I said, there are, there are visions here that would really free us from the shackles of the schools as we've known them. So there are, there are definitely visions where AI would free up. Um, so for example, a great, a great example is just like, uh, the curation of curriculum for students. Right? It takes a long time, especially if you have a classroom that has kids at different levels and, and it's hard to know how to get them interested. So the ability to know what's of interest to particular students and have an AI help you figure out what reading level they might be at. Uh, so there's ways that we can build AI to assist teachers um, and that would liberate us from the over bureaucratization and routinization 
of a lot of what was occurring. Um, so I think, but I think like, so right now, the question of will ChatGPT make people better or worse writers is I think an open question, right? Um, will the ability of a machine to, for example, help you think through a complex problem in physics, uh, will that make physics teachers obsolete already, even without any of the fancier stuff? Um, so I think the problem higher education has had with the internet now for a long time, which is why go to college if the internet exists, <laughs> uh, that problem just got multiplied. Um, and so I think college's responses to that problem were, we're gonna build sports facilities and let the kids party. And so I think the, the response has been that well, college isn't about education. <laughs> uh, it's about a certain kind of uh, domestication um, as is most schools. So, so yeah, I, d I don't, I think it's going to change higher education. Absolutely, it's already, it already is. The extent to which it's going to improve it, I, I don't know. But don't you think it could improve it? If we uh, use it as a tool and then we can't have, you know, these standardized tests, we can't ask for written essays. We're, we're looking for maybe, you know, uh, more project-based learning where you can demonstrate and that kind of yep. thing. It could, but then there's this question of what's the value of the writing of the essay? Like the, and that's what I meant by like writing is an interesting one. Like the internet has already messed with writing a lot, uh, as has texting. Um, and the nature of digital is such that we could move back to or forward to an oral culture, right? Like, why are we torturing college kids to write essays? Um, why don't we just make them really good speakers? Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Honestly, like part of me is very conservative. And I'm like, no, we should write papers. Like, we should write, we should be writers. <laughs> like it's bad that we're offloading writing to a machine. And then part of me is like, yeah, but a lot of people don't need to write. Like, why do you need to write? Or like, want I, to write. Or want, want to write. write. Yeah, right. So I like if, if I can, the choice. Yeah. yeah, if I can speak into a computer and then chat GPT turns my speech into a legible thing, what's wrong with that? So. So, so I really don't know how to answer your question. And um, in general, as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> like, I think, I think mostly this is going to be very confusing and destabilizing. Um, and uh, yeah, then there's also the factor of how it affects uh, research practice. Um, like now you can do potentially meta analyses across huge data sets and like so there's all of these possibilities for augmenting the practice of science and, and research in universities as well um so thank you yes who's who's next here jonas thanks a lot um i was curious about um the tension between AI and exponential technology and uh, possible decomplexification that we will experience. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Nate Hawkins, for example, he talks about the great simplification. And for me, these seem like very, two very real, but very different trajectories. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're, the, Nate Higgins's work, I actually spoke with Nate earlier today, he has a basic model of the unsustainability of energy use patterns that are subservient to an economic model that requires infinite growth. Um, so if you have infinite growth on a finite substrate, the thing self terminates. And so he's suggesting that there is a coming radical reconfiguration of both the economic and the energy systems that are just built into the basic physics of how the planet works and how math works. Um, <clears throat> what AI does, even in its current state, is speed that up. 
Because right now, as I said, you can couple narrow AI to most existing technologies and make them go faster. So your rare earth mining operation in Africa becomes more efficient, right? Your food production and delivery facilities become more efficient. Your ability to do high finance trading becomes more efficient and faster. Um, your ability to create propaganda goes exponential. So like right now we can just lock AI onto existing systems and those existing systems are already unaligned with value and ecosystem. And so then they just go faster. So my main thought is that yes, AI will essentially prove Nate right faster. Um, uh, but AI also opens up energy, potentially opens up energy frontiers. So like AI will also help you find oil where we couldn't find it before. AI will help you with your fracking operations. Um, AI could help us design better solar panels or something, right? So, um, but AI uses a lot of electricity. Like this is one of those things that no one really wants to talk about is what it actually takes to make the GPU clusters, which is the huge banks of computers, what it takes to make those and what it takes to sustain those. And the making of those is the harvesting of rare earth minerals and how many thousands of gallons of water it takes to make your Macintosh computer and all of that. Uh, and then the electrical throughput for the GPU clusters uh, are also quite uh, intensive and we just get more intensive. So that's just another, even if AI helps us find more energy, making the AI systems large enough to help you with your fracking operation might not get energy on return investment. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so it'll just speed up Nate's basic process. Um, so yeah, so that's not good. So that's my, <laughs> that's my answer there. Thank you. Who's ever next there, Mike? Hi. Well, thanks very much for that. I, 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 I really enjoyed it. There's a lot to think about and which I, I can't respond to in real time. Um, and I'm so pleased with it. You brought such a critical and nuanced view to, to your subject because I was slightly worried we were going to get a how to make AI wonderful to reinvent education and solve all human problems, which I would have been very and very problematic. However, you know, and, and this is obviously a very ongoing discussion, but you, you're still, I, for all your very accurate criticisms of it, um, which can also be augmented by all sorts of other things about whose data is being used and who it belongs to and where it comes from and is it accurate and blah, blah, blah. Um, you are still, you've still got this sort of assumption that it's, it's going to happen, which could be, a, I mean, I'm not disputing that as quite a, a likely assumption to make, given the, the financial power behind it, it, the, the development. Um, but w when I think, you know, here we are as a group of people, I don't think that many of us know each other, but coming together for a conference on reinventing education um, and ecoversities. Um, I'm wondering whether we have to make that assumption that this is going to happen and we have to therefore try and make it good. I, I, I speak as someone who was involved in one of the first community uh, in, informatic networks on the World, World Wide Web in Britain. I've done all sorts of things. So, oh, yeah, we can do this with it. We can do this with it. And here yep. we are 30 years later. I'm poor. Some other people are very, very rich. And, and the social, but more importantly, the social relationships have got worse. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, but what uh, this is a question, I really don't know, but can the negatives be, be in some sense regulated to, to get back to what you completely yeah. correctly pointed out are perfectly useful, viable and profitable uses of AI to, to manage various sort of you know, mundane activities, if you like, supportive activities. And, and shouldn't we be perhaps concentrating on, as, as, as educators for the future 
on the things that we are actually so ignorant of and which 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 there isn't the sufficient data for AI to even participate in so you know such as the e ecological uh, crisis uh, the awareness of of the knowledge of other cultures and languages and 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 you know gendered behaviors and and what you know what the possibilities for an anti-patriarchal or non-patriarchal society are it seems to me that these require um educational processes which we haven't invented yet and these might be more productive kind of focuses for our attention so i, I put that to you as yeah. a bit of a challenge i mean so i i do think the train has left the station but that said um <clears throat> the the argument that needs to be made about ai is an argument about restraint so it's not, uh, these things can be built. It's a question of should we build them? And so far, most of most like history shows that we just can't help ourselves. <laughs> like that we're, we're going to explore all of these possibilities and not exercise restraint. Now, the only example of us exercising restraint that's dicey is that we haven't dropped another nuclear bomb. And I don't even want to say this because I don't want to like curse the world, but we, we haven't dropped another nuclear bomb. And the entire post-war order, like it or not, was set up to try to stop us, <laughs> to try to have a sense of restraint. Mutually assured destruction was in a sense articulation of like, have restraint, like keep the toy in the box. Don't take it out of the box. Uh, and so similarly for AI, I think we're in a situation where, where if it doesn't happen, it's because we've made convincing enough arguments and been able to demonstrate that this thing needs to be just kept in the box. Um, <clears throat> so that would be my response there. And then I'd say if you're interested in the kind of non patriarchal and kind of these things. Um, there's a way that that specific set of ideas could be used to promote AI tutoring systems. Because it's not a man or a woman. Like it's not a human. Like none of those categories that people are having problematic apply to this thing. <laughs> it could be arguably freed from all prior biases that a teacher would bring. Teachers are rife full of racism and sexism and teachers just come with that. This wouldn't. So this is the transhumanist argument that leverages leftist ideology into techno utopias. Um, so we have to be, you have to be interested in how this thing's going to take every possible ideological route towards its actualization. And um, so yeah, but that's my, that's my sense. I'm, I've, I've seen too much of what's going on in the industry to think it's going to stop unless there's some, some kind of very serious effort to stop it. Uh, and even then, we don't know what's going on in China. Like we've, I've been trying to find out a lot of like, what are they doing with AI? Uh, I can tell you that they're not building a whole bunch of different tutoring systems for profit. I can tell you that. I can tell you they're building one centralized <laughs> uh, content creation, content creation system. So, <clears throat> so I'm just saying it's, uh, yeah, the train has left the station. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be actually doubling down on best practices of intimate human to human real education like that becomes more important now than ever <clears throat> and there will be pockets of resistance which is to say there will be communities that as a matter of principle decide not to adopt these technologies um, and that will be very important that some of those are created because um, they will be the control <laughs> in the vast experiment um, so i would totally support efforts to basically say like stop it like we're not going to adopt this, even though it could like potentially completely improve our, we're not going to do it. Um, so, so that's another way to not have it happen is to just create communities that have the resources to resist. So, but thank you for that. And there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, Olga, this will be the last question I imagine. Oh, hi. Um, yeah. I mean, I was considering lowering my hand because I think you answered already, but like, I wanted to just sort of, I'm not an optimist. I, I come from the tech world and I did work in AI for a brief bit and now I'm an educator 
and I see a lot of disaster scenarios, like a hundred percent, but like in the spirit of like, we're all in this conference and like, I see a lot of hope here and like a lot of good intentions and all that. Like I, I just wanted to posit some scenarios and sort of let me have your thoughts if you're willing. Like, I mean, I understand that AI is unalignable. I think it's unalignable perhaps because it's even built on science and tech that is based on models of reality that is not reality itself. Like we can't have like a finite model of something infinite like value or whatever, like just doesn't work. So I understand that, but like maybe in personalized AI, maybe there's some hope, like if AI has to deal with only one human and the, it's growing with the human, maybe there's some hope in that. Like I'm thinking of like, you know, we're probably each gonna be growing up with AI anyway, and which we'll, we all have, we'll have our own little AI agent or whatever, fine. But maybe that together with some kind of, because on the other side, there's like the growth of data. Like there's like, assuming that everything is open source and like, you know, democratic and not controlled by profit, of course, but like, uh, there's gonna be this like growth of data. And if like human data perhaps starts reflecting more wisdom than base instinct, then maybe there's some hope. And also, or alternative, like if our data is based on an analysis of a historical, the history of humanity so that it can tell us what is a good practice and what is not a good practice like what you know what is what is wise not wise but like what has led to historically a lot of deaths <laughs> and what hasn't or perhaps you know if we if we become more mindful and conscious like and then try to sort of think of our, our own motives of why we do things and perhaps that's something that educators can really start focusing on like sort of practices of wisdom then that might reflect itself in our data and algorithm might pick up on it. And like, I don't know, or like, or we try to instill the AI with some sort of consciousness, so assuming that's even possible, which I very much doubt, but but somehow some sense of impermanence and death and like humility, <laughs> maybe all of that could somehow kind of make things, mm -hmm. I don't know, not so destructive. I don't know, any thoughts on any of that? Um, mm. Yeah. So uh, I think there are positive scenarios. Um, as I said, if you have a non-humanoid domain-specific intelligence uh, that can, you can ask questions about the technology itself, uh, like there's, there's ways to do it. So, and again, there's, there's ones I've done with Nick Marks are interesting because there's a model where you put on the augmented reality glasses and every object in your visual field becomes a teacher. That you walk through the woods and every natural being has a super intelligence associated with it that can teach you everything you would ever want to know about it. Not about everything and about what's good for you and all of history. No, 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 no. It's a dandelion, right? But it's, it's, it's a hell of a dandelion because it can tell you everything about dandelions. <laughs> uh, and maybe you're an artist and you set your parameters for an artist and it will show you all the paintings done of dandelions. But if you're a scientist and you set your parameters as a scientist, it tells you the chemical composition of the dandelion and how it mates with other dandelions and things of that nature. Um, so that that becomes interesting because then you've completely re-enchanted the world and you've gone into a situation where the world can tell you about itself and the dandelion can tell you what the dandelion wants. You can go into a forest and it can be like, hey, I'm hurting. Like there's a disease in this forest. <laughs> uh, someone's actually donated Bitcoin or whatever. And if you help clean up these things, like the forest can give you a job, right? And it can tell you about itself. Uh, so, there, and then of course, we're not going to school then. <laughs> what are you doing then? Then you're, you're, you're moving around your city. You're moving around your town and the natural environment and becoming a student of the world in a very profound way. Um, and if you have questions about the dandelion, uh, you can be routed to other people who also have questions about dandelions. And so you can have a pop-up dandelion classroom in a field where everyone's kind of routed there. Um, so there's, there's huge possibilities. And, but, uh, but again, that's a very specific model. It's not me talking to one person who knows everything and I happen to be talking to them about dandelions, but I could be talking to them about Jesus or, or reincarnation or, you know, the big bang or something. Nope. It's not that. And it's never a humanoid. It's always the dandelion. Um, 
uh, or the tree or the cloud, right? Or that insect that just went by, right? And then you turn your visual field and a person comes up and then it gets really interesting, right? Um, how much are they allowing with their personal settings of you to see of who they are? How do you have the interface there? So there's all of these things about the social network possibilities of the augmented reality, suggesting you get into certain relationships based on similar interests. So there, there are real kind of concrete utopian possibilities, um, which as I said, I think completely obsolete schooling and are probably the only thing that could actually resolve the intensity of the meta crisis that we're actually in. Um, like if you consider the level of human coordination and problem solving, distributed human coordination and problem solving on a planetary scale and capacity building, right. it's huge. So I think we're at time here. Um, but yeah, so that's a good note to end on, that there, there we really could use these technologies to help ourselves solve the most complex problems, or we could use these technologies to create the worst problem. <laughs> Uh, that's my sense. Can, can I just can I just ask how? I guess so. Follow you. How do I how do I how do I keep tabs on this on this line of conversation and the, the greater uh, sense of the conversation? It's just yeah, it great, but I need I, I want to dive deeper. Yeah. So as I said, there's a series of videos I did with Nick Marks on YouTube. That's the place and I, I see see about this. Or Nik Marks. Yeah, Nick Marks. And then there's a recent podcast I did with Daniel Thorson on specifically this topic through the Emerge podcast. So that's, okay. probably, about, that's probably about eight more hours <laughs> of this kind of conversation, um, Great. all things told. Um, so, and then a lot of my recent writing has been on the Consilience Project website. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everybody.